And I said, if I can't move your property at this price, they're definitely not going to move your property at that price. And sometimes I'll even say, look, I'm close enough where I would be willing to take a shot at that price if it makes you feel more comfortable, but I'm just giving you a heads up. We might have to adjust this if it's not moving. Yeah. And I think that's an advantage that I do have over some of my competition is they're not having that top. These homeowners think that they're signing a contract that's going to close. And they think that the person who's signing the contract with them is the person buying the property. Yes. And overwhelming majority of the time, that's not the case. Hello, you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I am your host, Mr. Brandon Elliott. I'm excited today. I met this gentleman about a month or so ago over at a mastermind group that we have both invested in for real estate as well as just business growth, systemizing. A lot has to do with the book Traction, which is pretty cool and unique. So if you guys want the condensed, you know, cheap, read it right now type of version, jump into that book. It will start saving your life today and your business. But this guy blew me away in many different aspects because when I first started in real estate, I made a lot of mistakes. No matter how many books, podcasts, YouTube that I soaked in, mentors and so forth, I made so many mistakes. And I think everybody makes mistakes. But what is really cool is this guy found a partnership which is very courageous to start off with right away. It splits the responsibilities and accountability and so forth so that you grow together, but also really started or the idea of wanting to get this going wholesaling in November of 2021. In February 2022, just this year, a couple months ago, just a few months ago, actually started the process right? Like was spending the time, energy and resources to put together, systemize the business to get it prepared, then started at February. Now, just six months later, six, seven months later is really have the momentum, right? And have closed seven wholesale transactions, took down one buy and hold, which is awesome. And then have nine under contract right now, which is amazing. So Really excited to see the prosperity and growth at such a fast pace, I would say. And then it's just the beginning. Like people make so many mistakes in their first six, 12, 18 months, but with the right resources, because he invested in himself, I'm sure this has helped tremendously, but also really just taking action. And I think there's something special about taking those, you know, the first few months, the first four months from November to February, really build out the roles and responsibilities within that partnership to make it successful thus far. So uh, without further ado, Brett, what's happening, man? How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Brandon? Dude, I'm good, man. Thank you so much for jumping on. I'm I'm excited to have you. I know you are located in Georgia in the Atlanta market. The areas that your territory that you're going after is mostly northern of uh, Georgia and then, well, Atlanta in general, and then south of Georgia, but also... Huntsville, Alabama, which is a great market as well, booming. So wanted to just get that 30,000 foot view of like who you are, where you're from, what you're up to, and how this partnership kind of came about. Yeah. So first of all, appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Uh, This is the first for me. So, but yeah, so my background came from, I was selling home improvements for the last almost 15 years. So roofs, siding, painting, gutters, windows, doors, sunrooms, pretty much anything to fix up the houses. So I've been selling for about 15 years. And within that 15 years, I also did some sales management for about three years, growing a company. And then recently just came back into the home improvement space again. And as far as our partnership goes, I met Kurt. Kurt Bowen's my partner. I met him probably over 15 years ago through church. And we were in small group together and he was heading up the small group and we kind of grew from there. Actually, we did a joint venture together for a commercial roofing company at one point and we just could never get it off the ground. The, the profit margins just weren't where we wanted them. And then Kurt 
he joined uh, Boardroom Masterminds, which is the, you know, the group that we're both in. And when he went out there, he realized he had a partnership with his brother. They have a commercial real estate company that they've been doing for over 20 years. And they just bought out their family. So it's just him and his brother. And when they came out and joined Boardroom, they had this mindset to start the wholesaling side of things, just doing it for single family and kind of keep the commercial and the residential separate. And when they came out, they realized that they were too much alike and you need a sales side to the business. And yes. they didn't realize that until they came out. And so Kurt's brother graciously stepped aside and said, Hey, well, I'll, you know, I'll step aside and, and give you room to bring somebody on. And Kurt called me right away. He actually called me while he was at that boardroom meeting. I believe it was in September or August of last year. And so when he got back home, we kind of started doing this, like you said, putting the foundation together. And we had the mindset that we didn't want to do this. We didn't want to try to build it and live off of it, if that makes sense. So he had his commercial real estate. I was doing the bath remodels in home sales, making good money. We were both doing well with what we were doing on the side. So we said, you know what, let's do this. And just all the money that we get, we want to put it back into the company. Yeah. Uh, so we weren't going to be a crutch or you know a drain on the company so that we could try to, try to grow it as fast as we could. And it's really paid off for us, kind of getting to the point now where I'm hoping to step away at some point, but it, that could be a year from now, it could be six months, we don't, we don't know yet. Sure. But we started the company, we put foundations together and you know, we had, like you said, everybody runs into the, the mistakes and, and the learning curve. And so we had some changes we had to make and still making them, you know, still learning. We feel like we're still an infant in this thing, but we give most of the credit to the boardroom. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I mean, very analytical group that really breaks down everything that, you know, the KPIs tell a story, right? And the systems behind it, there's a moving function to every single business. And it really is simple when you map it out and you have the right mentors around you, the right people around you that are doing big business that can show you every little piece of it and break down where the mistakes are taking place so that you can avoid them and overcome them. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, that was the thing in that in that first boardroom that I went to. I think it was the same one you you started in yeah. um, San Diego, December of last year. One thing, you know, we were just starting the process, and one thing that we were picking up from a lot of people were like people were not tracking their KPIs. They weren't monitoring where they were going, so they were just this ship out in the ocean with no captain, no direction, no goals yeah. or anything. And KPIs are so important, so you know where you're going. And you can make adjustments along the way and spend your money the correct way. So I think it's so important. Yeah, it's very good. I love it. So talk to me. Tell me, you know, I, I love how the partnership lined up. That's uh feel like uh, church related is always a, a good start, you know, right. still treat it like business, you know, have your contracts right. in place and everything. But it is a good start for sure. And then, you know, tell me, you guys spent several months kind of building out the systems and everything before you actually jumped in and took action on, hey, I think we're ready now. Let's get this marketing going. So what did that look like for you guys? Why the wait instead of just rushing in like some crazy people do? Like, you know, what what really started it letting off the light bulbs of like, hey, we should slow this down, take the systems in place, get prepared and then rock and roll. So as you know, when you start something like this, like you're you're pumped, you're yeah. you're excited, you just want you envision like making a million dollars like right off the bat right yeah <laughs> and so i guess it goes back to that mindset that you know when we started the the roofing company i you know as being a man of faith i think everything happens for a reason right and yeah. i like to pick up those nuggets along the way and try to learn from them when we started the roofing company i kind of stepped away from my home improvement sales position where i was making you know over one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year i kind of stepped away too soon and mm, okay. uh, it kind of was the a bigger issue as we went forward. And one of the main reasons that I feel like the company kind of just didn't take off. Okay. And, um, and so this time around, we had that discussion because it's the same partnership. Um, so we, we both had that experience together and we both sat down and really discussed, Hey, let's, let's do this slower. We don't have to rely on it. Let's, let's just keep doing what we're doing. And, you know, one thing that was a big change for us was the CRM, the software that we were using to track everything which again, not everybody uses any software. Some people are just writing in books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Winging which it. Which makes it so hard. 
but we started with Podio. That was a, a, a name that we kept hearing. Sure. And we, we just didn't like it as we were moving forward. There was nothing like super wrong with it. It just didn't have the build out that we wanted. It, it just didn't do the things we wanted. And when we came to the second boardroom in February, we believe we were in Fort Lauderdale uh, this, this year. Some people had started mentioning RE Simply. And so uh, my partner actually, he actually did some free trials on like six different CRMs. Like, and he was just role playing all of them, you know? Yeah. And this was the one that he landed on. He ran it by me and I loved it right away. Coming from the sales background, all of those companies were larger companies and they had these CRMs in place. And so the software is just, I can't say enough about it. I could talk about it for yeah. like hours, just how great it really has helped direct our our company and it tracks the KPIs for us. So, And which which software is that that's setting you guys up for success here? RE Simply. RE Simply, cool. Yep. Yeah, so that can, I mean, it really sets you up for success because it has everything really dialed in for you guys. It's really made for investors in, in so many ways. So you're handling the acquisition side, correct? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then Kurt is handling the disposition and the back end. So he handled, he's doing all the marketing, doing all that stuff. He's handling, he's put together all of the dispo side of things. But now that we have that up and running, we found that it's easier for me to just dispo it as soon as I get it under contract. Uh, okay. That way there's no, there's no disconnect or no time difference. It just seems to be working better that way. And maybe once I come full time to do this, maybe we hire a dispositions person or something like that. That's the vision I see because it's not something that I really enjoy. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and but, that's that's so good to I think that's such a key factor too of like realizing what you don't enjoy, but also what you do enjoy, writing that pros and cons out. And then what are you good at? You know, like what are you really good at that like you'll find your lane? Jennifer, for example, she found her lane a while ago that and something that she really likes, she really like geeks out on, goes to town and loves it and feels fulfilled, like enjoyed. And she's really, really good at this particular thing. And it's like, you know, that's her lane, you know, instead of us paying other money for other people, it's like it's going to come out not as good and and quality and so forth. And her doing other activities, it's like not as productive and she doesn't like it, you know, enjoy it. So it's better to hire out those things. So I, I love that. And that's goals. You know, everybody, just so we're all clear here, listeners, starting out for your first six months in anything, you're going to have to put in the grind. Like you're going to have to put on the multiple different hats and do the stuff that you don't like and stuff that sucks, right? But that's part of the game, right? And I think it's also important to do so because you're going to learn that position. You're going to learn how to kind of keep an eye on it and and you can relate with other people. Like when we picked up our first couple Airbnbs, we were cleaning, Jen and I were cleaning the Airbnbs ourselves just because we wanted to get a feel for it and be like, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be too tough on the cleaners when I didn't even like ever experience cleaning a place. Right. So I think it's important to kind of live out that so you can relate as well. Talk to me. So, so you really wanted to set yourself up for success. You got the CRM in place. You got other avenues for lead generation to be able to, you know, set it, not set it and forget it, but like set yourself up for success and not rush into things like the last time that you learned from the mistakes in the past. So the kudos to you for doing that. Cause most people, like you said, they're, everybody thinks you're going to hit a home run and get a million dollars like today. So you want to jump in right away, but Talk to me, what are the lead generations that you are focusing on? I believe you said it was what, mailers, text, and cold call? Yes, yes. So we use Launch Control for our texting service. Cool. We use Lamasu for our cold calling, and we use RE Print Mail for our direct mails. Now, for the cold calling and the text messages, both of those, we use what's called a managed services through those companies. And so they basically, we have full-time full -time people from both of those that are just one guy's just calling people, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week, and the other guy's texting people. And then once they get somebody who's interested in selling, they actually kind of do the legwork to get the information. So the details of the property, what they're looking to sell it for, are we within a range? And then they send it to me. And something you said a few minutes ago kind of hits home with me because you'll hear a lot, like in our boardroom, you hear it a lot, like the hustler mentality, right? Yeah. Um, so people see, yeah, people see people that have, 
some success or they're starting to have a lot of success right away. And they think that it's just easy because that's all they see is the result. Yeah. But I tell you, when I tell people my schedule, if I would have told myself my schedule a year ago, <laughs> I wouldn't believe ago, it myself. I would have been like, there's no way somebody can do that. Yeah. Um, so, so just a little bit about me personally. So, you know, I work full time. I work about 40 to 50 hours a week doing the in-home sales. And then when I'm not running appointments, because I'm all over Atlanta doing yeah. that, when I'm not running appointments, in between appointments, when I get home at night, I jump on the computer and the managed services is what helps me because they only send me the warm leads. I don't have to deal with the, you know, the people telling you to F off and yeah, <laughs> to, that's good. to go kick rocks. It keeps your so, mindset a little bit more clear and not want to be on like suicide watch of, I hate this job, you know? <laughs> right. And the hard part was, is some days I don't get home till nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Other days yeah. I might get home earlier, but what I was struggling with is, you know, I don't want to be a rude person either. So I'm not going to yeah. call somebody about their house at nine, 10 o'clock at night. Right. Yeah. So what was happening was I was getting home late on some nights and I, I wasn't being able to contact people and say, Hey, we got, I got your message today. Yeah. Let's talk about your house. And this is probably the biggest game changer with RE Simply, the software. I realized that I could schedule text messages to go out whenever I wanted. So I could nice. schedule it for nine, 10 o'clock the next morning. While I was out running appointments, these people were getting responses and, and text messages from me, even offers. But, you know, besides the two jobs that I'm running, we've got four kids at home, all under the age of, of 10 years old. One of them's 11 months old. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm part of the HOA board. I'm involved at church. We, we make sure that that's a commitment to us on Wednesdays and Sundays. So there's just all three boys are in baseball right now. So it's all different days, different times. And so... My wife is is a blessing to me because she handles a lot of that stuff, but I do try to show up when I can. Yeah. So all of this thing and really through the boardroom has helped me become a better time manager. I'm still not perfect. If you talk to my wife, she would say I never spend time with her, but I know I could be better, but it is tough right now. And that's why we're kind of looking for that end game for me to transition, to just go into this when it's the right time. And then that might help free up some time because at the end of the day, the main goal is to have a better life, right? Not to hustle. Yeah for your whole life. Yeah, but. yeah. And that's the thing. It's like in the beginning, there's definitely a season for putting on the hustler hats. And that's probably how we all get here to becoming an entrepreneur, right? Not everybody has the cojones, like the guts to really step outside to do the extra things. Like, so once you actually step outside and start seeing the success from it, yeah, you're going to have to put in extra time, extra hours, sacrifice here and there and wear the multiple hats. But over time, as you start seeing the success and and start, you know, really succeeding in certain roles, then you can start hiring out and filling up your team, right? right. So I love how you guys really set up for, for success in the very beginning by hiring out these companies for the lead generation to also, you know, take those crazy calls or do the text blast for you <laughs> and all these other things, the mailers and so forth, so that you can get the hot leads right away. And then you're just following up that makes it a heck of a lot like more attractive, right? So how much time would you say is the real estate side being that it's all systemized currently? How much is it truthfully taking from you on a, on a weekly basis? Oh, so I probably put in between appointments and before work and after work, I'm probably putting in about Usually anywhere from about three, I would say three to six hours a day. Okay. So, three to six, yeah. Okay. Three to six hours a day on just following up and making sure that offers are getting sent out, the text uh, automations are going out, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once I get the details, I still have to go in and try to figure out ARV and yeah. you know what I can offer and what the repair costs are going to average. And so that takes probably the most time for each one. So I spend probably about 15 to 30 minutes on each one. And I'm averaging about anywhere from four to six, maybe more on, on heavy days, but four to six new warm leads a day. Like I had it all cleared last night and I've got three right now that are already come in this morning. So, you know, and I would say out of the ones that I get, I'm going to offer on maybe 20% of them. Okay. Um, so some so of those still don't work out. 
you're not offering on on everything no no even, now, if, even if it's a uh, you know there you guys are completely off you're still not just throwing it out there Sometimes I will. It just depends on how off we are. But if somebody's wanting at or above what the value is of the house right off the bat, I'll try to have a conversation with them. I might send them a text and say, hey, we actually have partnered with some real estate agents in the area, some friends of ours that we know that are doing real estate. And we've kind of got them split just depending on which zip codes these calls come in from. So if I'm in that situation, I'll say, look, uh, you know, I don't want to insult you with an offer. I know you're asking. 400,000 and I just can't get anywhere close to that. If you don't want to list the property, I will shoot you an offer anyways. I just don't want to insult you, but it might put more money in your pocket if you were to list the property on the MLS, just based on the details that you've given me. And if you don't mind, I can even shoot your information over to a friend of mine that handles all that stuff. It has nothing to do with us. And if you want to go that route, just let me know and I'll shoot their information over so that they can reach out to you. And so we're actually getting, so what we do with those, if they go under contract with those people and they sell them, we just get 1% of their 3%. So we, we're still making a little bit of money anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand to five or 10,000, just depending on the value. How many of those so, deals have closed thus far? I don't think we've closed any on those. Okay. We just recently started adding that to our repertoire because we figured we were missing things. Yeah, yeah. And so that partnership is fairly new, but just to give you an idea, I've sent we have two of them and I've sent probably, I'm just guessing here. I've probably sent about five to 10 to each in the last month or two. Okay. Gotcha. And so they're still working out. Uh, some of them are, some of them are under contract. They're just waiting on them to close. Yeah. Yeah. But none have closed yet. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think there's a, a key, it's very respectful how, how you're going about it, which is very honorable, right? I think there is an education piece there that could be beneficial of educating the the leads that are coming in because everybody and their grandmother, especially if they're emotionally attached to it, believes that it's worth this much or they anticipate a little negotiation. So they start off high, really high, unrealistically high, uh, not knowing the market or the area or their true property. and And they're trying to you know, cash in very big without the proper education. And they think maybe you guys are going to negotiate a little bit. I, I think there's power in educating properly and saying, you know, we are completely off. I'm closer to around a, you're asking 400K. I'm closer to 100K. I'm not trying to disrespect in any means, but these are the reasons why bang, bang, bang and show articles or, you know, why inventory stacking up or how you have to make money on it too. And like, no, it's just going to sit if you locked it in anywhere close to their prices, it's not going to sell. So it's, it can't be a win-win there, but, but then give them the option, like you said to, Hey, if you want, I can't pay you this much, but maybe if you go with a realtor, you could potentially make a little bit more, but it's still probably going to sit on the market for a good amount of time in the market that we're in currently. Right. So I, I think that it's important. A lot of these sellers are unrealistic, right? Are you finding that a good bit? Because you're making offers on about 20%, you're saying, right? Yeah, the, it is unrealistic for a lot of them. And yeah. like you said, it's it's either they, they're attached to it or they have a realtor friend that told them this or they have somebody that told them that. And when you start pulling the comps in the area, people don't understand that even in that hot market that we had, the hardest thing that I found that people could not wrap their head around was even in a hot market, yes, houses are going for 25, 30, 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars more, but you can't ask for that because it'll never appraise for that, right? Yes. If you ask for what it's worth and somebody goes over it, they have to pay the difference. Yep. But if if you ask for more, if you're like, oh, I think I can get 50 grand over. Well, you ask for that and then somebody goes under contract and then it appraises for 400, they don't have to buy the house. Yeah. You're back at negotiations again. So I find that a lot. And uh, now with the shift in the market, it hasn't really caught up to sellers or even real estate agents. I find real estate agents are starting to get it. Really? But, but <laughs> sellers sellers still think it's a hot market. And it's like, yeah. go, go, go look at the houses in your neighborhood that are bigger than your house and they've been sitting and they've been dropping in price for like 30, 60, 90 days. 
Yeah. And it's inventory is stacking up. You know, it's not selling as quick, but that means that all these other properties yeah. are coming on the market and people that are very motivated, you know, they need to sell. So they're going to start dropping. So, you know, what are you going to do? The market will dictate how much it's worth and and people aren't waving the appraisal contingent stuff like that. It's not happening like it was a couple months ago. Right. And people don't realize that when you're on the MLS, you're going to get people that come and look at your house that are looking for a house to live in. Yes. They have personal attachment to it. As an investor, I don't have a personal attachment to your property. It's, yeah. it's business, right? So I have to make smart business decisions. I can't pay you more for your house because it has something that you love. And that's not really going to like... <laughs> I, because you built this, you know, a uh, little wine cooler and it's, right. you know, you spend 10 grand on it. It looks amazing. You know, well, right. I love it too, but you know, <laughs> I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm buying it to flip it or like, it's not going to add value to the property. So that's right. Yeah. It's important to uh, educate. Right. It's so, that's so right. crucial. Cool. Well, I just want to go back because I'm very attracted to the systems you guys put in place and really outsourcing from the start you know, the different lead generations, because now it saves you so much time, you're getting real hot leads that come in. And you don't need to hire on like a whole army of people and training them and so forth. Like they're already good to go with these companies. So what is roughly the investment to be a part of, you know, have those type of companies doing the a lot of the legwork for you in the beginning? So I believe, I believe we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of Oh, you know, Kurt handles this, so I'm not going to okay. be exact. But I, I want to say uh, it's costing us somewhere between four and six thousand dollars a month for the two managed services. Yep. And then the direct mail we send out every three months, and I'm not sure what we're spending on that. It might be like three grand every six months or every three months. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm not positive on that one. And then the softwares we've spent some money on. Again, Kurt has handled that. It's not too crazy. Uh, and then, of course, to me, our best investment we've made is the boardroom mastermind with Ken yeah. Clothier. And that's going to run you, you know, 25, 30 grand to invest. So we do that. We just renewed that one. So we just find it so valuable. We've got so much information from it that we're going to continue doing that. That's good. I love it. Okay. Talk to me about, you know, I know we were just talking about the market a little bit. How do you feel about it? Is there any fear, anything going through your mind that I know you're a man of faith? which is good. Me too. And, you know, canceling out fear and, and realizing, you know, where we're at, just adjusting and, and taking territory. It's a big deal. Um, but, you know, you kind of, you jumped in right at the peak as it's uh, you know, back in February. I remember we had a property in April that closed and we netted 400 and 75K. It went over asking price $210,000. I was shocked. <laughs> and we had other offers that were even higher, but we were like, no, we really like this family, you know? So we went with them, you know, we didn't want to get too greedy. <laughs> right. It's crazy though. So, and then just a couple months ago, you know, a few months later, it, you know, it's taken a big halt. So how do you feel about it right now? What kind of predictions do you have? So honestly, just the success that we've had, you always go back in retrospect and like, man, I wish I would have done this 20 years ago. Yep. But especially wish I would have done this, you know, yeah. two or three years ago, right? Yes. <laughs> it's 2019, 2020, this thing started to take off. And I can't imagine the people that were just full swing and, and during that. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's definitely shifted. Like you said, I'm a man of faith. I think everything happens for a reason. I know that me and my family are going to be okay and we're going to get through this. And I think it does help that I have another job, right? Yep. I probably would have stepped away earlier until this shift happened. Like we probably were, we were already planning on me stepping away, but then sure. when this shift happened, we were like, you know, it's probably not the best time. And I really am dedicated to the other job. I make good money at it. I love it. It has its ups and downs, but I appreciate it. You know? Yeah. As far as the market goes, you know, I think, especially over the last couple of days, actually, I put one contract, they signed it last night. And then I sent another one out. I've been in negotiations with, I'm just waiting on them to sign it. I believe they're going to sign it today. So I've been adjusting how much we're going to discount it. So if we're yeah. going to wholesale the property, I know that those people need a repair cost and then they're going to need a profit, right? And, and a lot of people want that 30% profit range. Over the last six months to a year, 
it was really more like 10%, 20%, I could land properties and, and get rid of them. But now I'm adjusting to that 30 to 20% range, just depending on just depending on the situation and where it's at. And I've noticed over the last couple of days, there's been some better feedback. But you know, over the last few months, they just don't want to hear it. They think that's low. They've had better offers. Yeah. And really, I, mean, I think the biggest thing I'm competing with are other investors because these are off-market properties. So I already know if there's somebody else who gives you an offer, chances are 99% yeah. of the time it's a, and it's an investor. And I know in the back of my head, they're just going to try to wholesale it too. I know the number they're buying it for, they're just not going to be able to do it. And, and they might, like there's always a possibility they might have the right cash buyer, but I have a lot of cash buyers too. And I'm 10% less on the value for profit margin for these people and they're still not buying. Yeah. Um, and so I try to, like you said, educate the customer is so huge. So I'll try to educate the customer. I'll just say, look, it's probably another investor. They're probably doing what I'm doing. They're probably not sharing with you that one avenue is to wholesale. And so what they're going to do is just tie the property up for 30, 60 days, whatever you agree to. And if they can't find a cash buyer, if they're not prepared to buy the house, they're just going to call you back and say, hey, we're either going to have to cancel or extend. And I know this because it's what I have to do. Yeah. And I just tell them that, right? And I said, if I can't move your property at this price, they're definitely not going to move your property at that price. And sometimes I'll even say, look, I'm close enough where I would be willing to take a shot at that price if it makes you feel more comfortable. But I'm just giving you a heads up. We might have to adjust this if it's not moving. Yeah. And I think that's an advantage that I do have over some of my competition is they're not having that talk. These homeowners think that they're signing a contract that's going to close. And they think that the person who's signing the contract with them is the person buying the property. Yes. And overwhelming majority of the time, that's not the case. And so they come to find out that that happens. And I've had several people call me back where I'm like, look, if you, if you feel like you can get that better offer, that's a good offer. I just don't think they're giving it to you. Yeah. And so I've had people call me back 30, 60, 90 days later and say, you were right. What do we need to do? And I said, well, look, if he couldn't move the property at that price, I'm not going to be able to move the property at that price. Let's talk about where we want to start. And then we can actually move the property down lower if we need to as we go. And then you'll get to a price where you're just not willing to get rid of the property. And that's OK. We can part ways at that point if you want to. Well, you know, I, I think there's something special, too, because a lot of people do that method of we'll, we'll bring it down just a little bit. We'll bring it down a little bit more in the future. But I feel like it almost makes it more difficult at that point. You know, it, it's almost stronger to be very aggressive in some cases. Like we have one on the market right now. It's worth every penny, but in my opinion, but the market's telling me otherwise. Right. So we <laughs> dropped it. We dropped it. Two hundred and fifty thousand, you know. 250,000 is a, a big, you know, it's well under what it could appraise for or what other properties are being listed at. And so we anticipated a, you know, a roaring of a bunch of people coming in and kind of bid it back up a little bit. And it's still not the case because there's so much fear. So with that being said, we might need to drop it another aggressive amount instead of doing just, you know, 50, 100K because we thought about stuff like that. And right. And this now, is now, my, you mind you, that one? whoever's listening to this, this is San Diego. They're all a million and a half plus. <laughs> yeah. So just be mindful. You know, we start with big we're, margins. Where mine are like 200, 300, 400,000. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going in the negatives? How you doing it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're in some markets like uh, Rome, Georgia and Macon, Georgia, where these properties are worth like eight to $25,000. It's yeah. just, and it's so hard to do something because the renovations cost more. Yeah. And what the house is going to be worth when it's done. Yeah. You know, those are tough markets for sure. By the way, when you, when you brought it down 250, did you end up, I know we discussed this. Did you end yeah. up dropping it and then just re, or did you just drop the price? We dropped it. And then like, did you do a new listing or did you just drop the price on that current listing? We dropped it originally. And then we got it tied up about a week and a half later. And that one fell out of contract. Uh, and that's what I, I brought up at, at the last mastermind group. So so yes, afterwards, we ended up taking it off the market and then putting it back on to make it look like a, a new. Now, did y'all take this one down or is this a wholesale deal that you're trying to do? No. Yeah. We don't do any wholesaling. We just do fix and flips and, and buy. And I prefer buy and holds, but the last year or so, it's been good for fix and flips. So we've, we've taken it down a few. 
But yeah, buy and hold, doing the burst strategy is our bread and butter and short-term rentals. Have you thought about renting that property then? I mean, yeah, yeah, we are considering starting to do a cash out refinance on it so that we can. Uh, I only have 920K locked into it, hard money. So I still have plenty of room to be able to get that out. And, uh, and that's not due until March. So I got some time on it. But yeah, we just got locked into contract again about a week ago, but it was contingent that they sell their property. And it's, you know, that's not selling. So have you talked to him about buying that property? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that one's, yeah, that one's not a, a renovation and it they gotcha. want, they want a good amount. So, but yeah, it's just, it's the market, you know? So I think you hit the nail on the head when it comes down to no need to be fearful, but be realistic and adjust your numbers. That's it. Just adjust your numbers. Like what is going to be that home run number that it's going to make somebody feel like they are solid, they're good, and that there's no fear for them. And we might need to have those tough conversations with the sellers or whatever situation you're in and say like, you know, what is your true bottom line? Like, how fast do you want to sell this? Are you okay selling? Like, do you want to sell it in five, seven, 10 days? Or do you want to sell it potentially in a couple of months? Because that's going to depend on how far we can come down here to make it a real win-win scenario, but a a steal of a deal for somebody that is going to come in in a fearful market right now that people just aren't buying. And the right. longer you wait, the more inventory stacks up, the less likely you'll be even able to get in another month or two that that bottom dollar that you once were okay with. Now you're going to be begging for that bottom dollar and you still might not be able to get it. You know, That's right. And one thing that I'm, I'm not banking on it, but I think it's going to happen and nobody's really talking about it a whole lot right now is, you know, all of this booming, you know, price increases, the market going up, right? That That's all happened since COVID, right? Inflation yeah. and all that's driven that. And now that the interest rates are coming down, you know, this is what's slowing down the market and people are getting a little bit more fearful. But something that's not being talked about is there are a lot of homeowners out there that during COVID, they had to restructure. They couldn't pay their bills, right? The banks and the landlords were not allowed to evict anybody. That was on hold. They weren't allowed to do anything with it, right? And so they were deferring the payments to the end and things like that. Uh, having them do a second mortgage, yeah. um, you know, different things like that. But a large portion of those people still can't make their mortgage payment. Yeah. And so now that that's over with and these people can start the eviction process, it takes months for that to happen. Yep. I think that that's going to catch up in a couple of months and there is going to be a large portion of people that right now they would sell because they think the house is worth, you know, $400,000 and it's really worth 375. Sure. They might be willing to come down because they bought the house 5 years ago for and they're, and they're about to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if they can walk away with anything, anything 25 grand, break not even, mess up but the not not mess up their credit, you know? That's like, right. Yeah. I, I think that's going to start to happen. We're actually working on a deal right now where that happened to this lady and she's super sweet lady. Yeah. And she's now through that period and she can't make her payments because medical reasons. Yeah. And they're going to start the pre foreclosure process. And so I told her, I said, look, we're willing to, we, this was some creative finance. We learned this out yeah. there. So I said, look, what we're willing to do is we're willing to, you owe, she owes 180 on the house. And we feel like a good purchase price would be about two, 210. And so we offered her 200. She asked for about 10 grand more. So we said, look, we'll, we'll give you 210. So at the closing table, she's going to walk away with roughly 30 grand. And then we're going to lease it back to her for a year at $100 a month. And all we're doing is we're going to pay her the 30 grand at closing. And then we're taking over her mortgage. We're, because she got her mortgage when it was, Three percent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we wanted to buy that mortgage right now, it's going to cost us five, six percent. Yep, and, and more if we're using you know someone else's money. Yeah. So you know it's going to cost us thirty grand, and then we're going to have to put like we're not going to put any money in the house for a year because she's going to continue renting it for a year, and we don't really have to put anything into it right now. And then she has an option to buy it back at value or whatever we want to sell it for at the end of the year if her situation is any different. And so I'm currently under under um, negotiations with her on that. The problem is 
is that she has other investors that are offering her 240 and 250, mm. but I think they're just going to wholesale it. I've explained that to her. Yeah, they're going to come down on price pretty quick too. You know, and she's going to run out of time for her. You know, it's going to sell at the courthouse steps if she doesn't <laughs> if she doesn't yeah. so it doesn't do anything quick. And they're not going to give her 250 just to just to do it. There's no value in it at that price. So yeah, and, yeah, they, and, won't, I, I, and they won't give her a year in the house. Yeah. And I think educating her on that, like showing the, the proof, right? Showing, and that's what it comes down to. Like when you can show like, Hey, I know these other guys are offering you 240, 250, but this is exactly how they're going to do it. They're going to say this, they're going to come back in once it's locked into contract. Once you sign about a week or two later, they're going to start coming back and saying, well, this price is too high. We need to come down and start playing games with you. And they're locked in contract with you. So now they can have wiggle room for 30 days, right? So right. it's important to know that this is what the true value is. And it's probably not even that because it's, you know, the market is, there's a lot of fear. So uh, if we, if you want to sell quick, this is the price, just straight being very blunt and educating the person, showing them, like guiding them to the water, basically the light bulbs are going to go off and they're going to be like, okay, this makes sense. I appreciate the transparency and the education. You know, this guy's not going to do me wrong. And this is going to be, you know, he's going to perform. So I think that's where the true value comes into play. You're solving problems. That's what real estate investing is. It just comes down to solving problems. And Brett, man, I'm just proud of you, bro. Like you're doing it. You're solving problems. You're making a difference and one property at a time. But it's so it's just the beginning for you guys. That's what's exciting. I love well, it. And, and I want to say thank you to you and Jen for, you know, the, again, the the boardroom just coming through, not just real estate, but personal in our yeah. lives. Right. And so recommending this 75 hard, I think we're on day like 15 or 16 right now. Let's go. And, I forgot and, uh, you jumped into that. Yeah. Good. I, yeah, I love, yeah. Thanks for the reminder. I, That's awesome. I, re I researched it as soon as y'all told me about it. Yeah. I came home, talked to my wife about it. She jumped on board. You know, we started a weight loss journey together and we wanted to do it smart. We didn't want to do like this, like big diet because it yeah. always goes back and forth. And she had just had our, our fourth baby. And so January 1st, we decided we were going to, you know, stick to a plan. And I actually put it on TikTok. I, I felt like for me, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in sales. So positivity is like something yep. that's important to me, uh, accountability. Yep. And so I knew that if I was going to make a post every week on TikTok, people were going to see it. And so it held me accountable for like, hey, don't, don't eat that donut because you've got to go make a post on Sunday. Yeah. And that first video we posted on TikTok, it actually has almost a million views and I've gained wow. like 20, 25,000 followers on TikTok. And I do some other goofy stuff on there, but we do a weekly weigh-in and we did great. I lost 40 pounds. My wife lost uh, about 25 pounds. And then we hit a plateau where it just wasn't, nothing was changing anymore. We gained a couple pounds, lose a couple pounds, but we stayed right around that, that, that same weight. Yeah. And then that's when you mentioned that you and Jen. And so we came home and we got started. This is, uh, you know, we're into our second week, second or third week. It's all running together now. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> first, first week or two, man, it's a lot. It's, and you think you don't have enough time and, and you make time for the things that you want. So we've made it happen. We're not perfect with it, but we've made it happen. We've stuck to the plan and we've started seeing the results, man. I, I yeah. feel better in what I'm doing. I'm more alert. I don't have that fogginess all the time. We've both lost about 10 pounds in the last two weeks. So yep. it's starting to it's starting to pay off. And, you know, drinking this water is so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, I fill up a, a gallon every day and then I I, I put it into uh, into my my bottle throughout the day. But yeah, that's I, I count these things. It's like five of these I got to have. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then reading the books, man. I got Kent Clothiers that I'm reading when I'm in my car and yep. uh, you know, running appointments. And then when I can't do that, and I get home, I'm reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So yeah, almost through both of those. And man, I appreciate it. I know some reading is something that I know I should have been doing all this time and I haven't. But I read something once yep. that said that if you look at all of the multimillionaires in the world, yep. the one thing that they all have in common is how much they read. They read a on, lot. On yeah. average, they read one book a, a month. So, yeah. um, you know, you got to get that. that if you, Hey, the, the brain's a muscle too. If you don't get it moving, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die on you, right? Yeah. And I mean, books unlock so much, so it's powerful. But going back to 75 Hard, you know, Andy Rosella, the one that created this, he's such uh, just 
uh, an awesome individual and a motivator and a tremendous businessman, man of faith as well. And when it comes down to this challenge, it's it's all up here. Like, yes, it's going to get tough. It's very, you know, it's two workouts a day, 45 minutes each, you know, one inside, one out. There's nothing easy behind it, but you'll prioritize, you know, even in a busy schedule, everybody in the world's busy now, right? But there's so many distractions, but you'll prioritize stuff that matters. And how I looked right. at it is 75 days. I mean, it's 75 days out of my life. If I can't stay committed to this for 75 days, then come on. But kudos to you because supposedly the stats are like 95 or 97 percent or something quit within their first three days yeah it, it's so crazy because nobody offers you free food or anything and it seems like every time i go into a sales meeting or something like that they have donuts or cakes or and i'm like man like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. temptation's know? real yeah it is it's like nope i'm good and you know what i've realized is i know that i'm creating habits i think that's yes. like you said it's the mental part yeah. So the whole goal is that after 75 days, I should crave water. I should want water. I'm not drinking anything but water. I should want to pick up a book and read 10 pages. Yeah. You know, I should want to go and do exercise or go outside. For me, the exercises can be even like if I go play ball with the kids in the yard, or we go walk around the neighborhood, we jump on the trampoline. Yeah. And then I'm committing one of those exercises is like lifting weights and actually doing something a little bit more strenuous, but Good. it's getting me involved with my family. Yeah. It, it's getting me outside. The tough part is, is when I'm working all day and then I come home and I haven't done either workout and it's like, Ooh, I spend yeah. an hour on the computer doing real estate and then it's 10 o'clock and I'm like, well, I have about an hour and a half that I've got to do this and it's raining outside. So now I got to go walk in the rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not fun. It's not fun, yeah. but you know, it's, you it. it builds up the the mindset. It builds up the adversity. Right. And that's what it's about. So I, I appreciate you, uh, you and Jen introducing that to me, man. Yeah, man. So. I'm just proud of you, bro. You're, you're crushing it in all areas, uh, family man and, and business and, and then really focused on doing this and with your wife too, you know, kudos to her. What a boss lady for stepping up to the plate and doing it with you. I, it, it's not easy for anybody, but it's good that you're doing it with your partner for sure. <laughs> right, right. Makes it easier. So anyway, brother, uh, I appreciate you so much. Tons of value today. I know the listeners took a bunch of notes like I did. Got a bunch here. And how can people get a hold of you? So on Facebook, I have a company page. You can, you can find my personal page if you like. It's um, uh, Brett Gann McIntyre. And then my company name is MB Buyers LLC. You can find that on Facebook as well. Our website is CCA Property or CCA Properties.com. That's our sister company. That's the the website that we're using for MB right now. We're gonna we're in the process of creating all that. And then if you want to find my TikTok, I'm gonna start putting more real estate on there just because yep. I know I have a following. So my TikTok is actually at Gator Hater, but it's G8 O R H eight E R. So there's okay. eights in there. But yeah, come tell me that you saw us and um uh, you know, say hi. If yeah. you have any questions, I'll, I'll answer them, man. I'll give you the time. Yeah, I love that, man. You got an awesome heart and it's in the right place. You're definitely going to be fruitful and blessed behind it. Guys, definitely reach out to Brett. He's a gangster in the space and doing some amazing things. It's going to be exciting to see. It's just the beginning, guys. So if you need any help setting up, you know, if, if you're holding yourself back from taking action and whatever the reason is, reach out to Brett. He's an open hearted person like, He'll, he'll give you all the keys that you need and, and be able to unlock it for you. So if uh, you have any questions, reach out to him. If you want to connect with me, then you can do so at Instagram. It's Brandon Elliott Investments. Otherwise, Facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor. If you need any credit repair done for you services, check out CreditRepairMobile.com. Otherwise, if you're really looking to get educated with all areas of credit and, and check out our mastermind group, CreditCouncilElite.com. We're teaching people how to get educated and show how to fix very quickly, build up very quickly, get several six figures, even seven figures in funding, and then being able to leverage it into assets like purchasing real estate or Turo, life insurance, e-com, you name it, anything that you are excited and passionate about, but the funds are holding you back. Let me show you how to flip the script on the banks and get as much funding from the banks to be able to hit your goals. You can check out once again, creditcounselelite.com. That's www.creditcounselelite.com. And as always, 
make sure you hit that subscribe button for Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. Leave a five-star review. Greatly appreciate all the love, support. Tag somebody in this that needs to see it. Share it out. You guys know what to do. Love you guys all so much. Brett, you are amazing. And uh, we'll talk soon. God bless. Thanks, Brandon. And go dogs. Yeah. <laughs> this has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. Brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.